Hello, this is the sermon for St Christopher's Church in Leicester for Sunday the 28th of June 2020. The passages for today are Psalm 85 and Luke chapter 13 verses 18 to 20. So if you haven't yet read them, pause this video, read them and then press play. I wonder what things you see yourself doing in a year's time. Where are the places you're going to be? What will you be doing and who, you, who will you be there with? And whilst you think about those questions, here's something else. If I had asked you those same questions six months ago, would the answers you give have been the same or different? What I'm getting at with this is the fact that what we think about the past and about the future is affected by what's happening to us in the present. Being asked the same question within a pandemic and outside of a pandemic might give very different answers. So, for instance, if you'd asked me six months ago, before the virus hit, what things I saw myself doing in a year's time, I might have spoken to you about the ministries I saw developing at St Christopher's and what my part in them might be. But if you ask me the question now, one of the answers you might get is that I see myself sitting in Café Nero in the centre of Leicester, drinking a coffee and reading a book. You see, that's the kind of thing I used to do on my day off and never really had to think about. But right now, things are different. And maybe some of the things you see yourself doing in a year are things that a year ago you wouldn't have given much thought to either. Going out for a drink, going to a swimming baths, or to a soft play, or having friends round for a curry. How we think about the future, and even the past, is affected by our experience of the present. But the question for us is, how much of how we think about the future is shaped by who we are as Christians? As Christians, we should, how should we be thinking about the future? And that's the question I want us to grapple with as we look at Psalm 85. In Psalm 85, we see there is reference to the past, the present and the future. Now, this psalm seems to be written during a time of agricultural crisis in Israel, a time when the crops are failing, at least to some extent. And that's suggested by the references to land, earth and harvest in verses 1, 11 and 12. And in this psalm, the writer looks back in verses 1 to 3, to when God has demonstrated his forgiveness and restoration in Israel's past. Then, in verses 4 to 7, he speaks to God about the present situation therein, asking him to intervene and rescue them in the same way. And finally, in verses 8 to 13, the psalm writer looks to the future, a future in which he sees the nation blessed once again, based on God's promise of peace and salvation for his people. So, we've got past, present and future. And from what the psalm writer knows of God from the past, he asks him to act in the future. He knows God is a merciful rescuer. He's shown them that before. Please God, do the same now like you did before. God, you will bring us out of this. As verse 8 says, he promises peace to his people. Sounds very straightforward, doesn't it, in a way? And maybe you're thinking it seems very easy to just take this psalm and try and instantly apply it to our coronavirus situation. But I don't think we can do that, or at least we can't do that without thinking a bit about the context first. This psalm is indeed a psalm which should encourage us. It is speaking to us, but we've got some work to do before in understanding how exactly it speaks to us. First of all, we need to remember that there is a difference between Old Covenant blessings and New Covenant blessings, and this psalm is written under the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant, 
back in the Old Testament, God's people lived in a particular place and experiencing God's blessings at that time was tied to obeying the Old Testament law. So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses lists the blessings Israel will receive for obedience. Verses 2, verse 2 rather, all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. But he also lists the curses they will receive for disobedience. Verse 15, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you. So God's blessings were bound up with the people's obedience. But in the new covenant, we have seen that Jesus has died for those who trust in him. And therefore, all of the curses for disobedience have instead come down upon him in his suffering and crucifixion. Therefore, through putting our trust in Jesus, we receive access to God's full blessings, but none of the curses because of Jesus' obedience. As Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And it turns out that the blessings we receive are eternal blessings, so much bigger than they received in the land under the old covenant. In the new covenant, receiving God's eternal blessings are not tied to our obedience. Instead, through Jesus' life, death and resurrection, we receive the fullness of God's blessings by faith. Being under the law means, I obey, therefore I'm accepted, which is unattainable, by the way. But being under the gospel means I'm accepted already through faith in Jesus Christ, therefore I obey. So we need to understand that this psalm is written within that old covenant framework. And some of the curses or punishments that God ordained back then involved agriculture. Some curses are about weather conditions which would make fruitful agriculture difficult or impossible. Hence the problem in Psalm 85. But having said all that, God of course does not change. He remains forgiving, he remains loving, he remains faithful. And those things are true whether back then or in our time. And the psalm writer knows this, and so he can pray. He is confident in God's mercy and is confident that salvation is near those who fear him, as verse 9 says. In faith, he believes that God in future will roll back their suffering and restore his blessings to them. And that's described in the last few verses of the psalm. And I want us to really consider those last few verses of the psalm. Because it's here that the psalm writer describes that future in beautiful, even poetic language. He's asking that God restore and revive his people. But look at how he does it and what he says. If his concern was nothing more than that the crops start growing again, he might have just asked for that with a simple request. Please God, can we have a good harvest this year? But no. For the psalm writer, restoration is wrapped up in experiencing God and his goodness. Just look at all the different words he uses uh, here in verses 8 to 13. He wants to see God's salvation, his glory dwelling in the land. Verse 10, he speaks of God's love, faithfulness, of righteousness and peace. All of it. This prayer is so much bigger than, could we have a decent batch of carrots this year, please, Lord? The psalmist wants to see 
God's glory and goodness in through him rescuing his people. And this brings us back to the question of how are we thinking about the future? Because it might be tempting now to just wish for the status quo to return and nothing more. We might even be praying that God would return our lives to what they were before coronavirus struck. But is that really what we want or what we should be praying for? Or do we want to come out of this with a vision of God's kingdom to a degree that we've never had before? Do we want to pray with the same heart that this psalm writer does? Do we want to see God truly at work in our home, in our homes, our church, our community, to an extent we've never seen before? Or are we just thinking about trips to Cafe Nero or a decent haul of carrots? You see, we should be seeing, seeking to see past, present and future through God's eyes, not ours. If we have been brought into his kingdom through faith in Jesus, then our whole vantage point should change. Because our own vantage points, looking forward, are small and us-centred so very often. And this is where we consider the two short parables of Jesus from our Luke reading. One of these is about a mustard seed being planted and growing into a mighty tree where birds can nest. The other is about a lady mixing yeast into a massive batch of flour, which would of course mean a massively expanded batch of bread. These are both parables about growth, massive growth. But growth of what? Well, the growth of God's kingdom. And if we are imagining our future as being simply a return to our pre-virus past, then these verses should, should challenge our thinking. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God broke into this world. His healings, his exorcisms, his teaching, his sacrifice. In him and his work done in the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God had come. And in these parables, notice Jesus promises that that kingdom would continue to grow within this world. Now it's not a kingdom with geographical borders like the United Kingdom in which we live, but a kingdom in the hearts and minds of believers where the Holy Spirit dwells. A kingdom where healings and exorcisms continue to happen in Jesus' name and in which the reign of God is seen and experienced. And these parables tell us that the pattern of the kingdom is growth. Yes, wars will come along. Yes, diseases and viruses will come along. Yes, famines will come along. All sorts of terrible things will come along. But through it all, the kingdom will grow. Sure, we might look at the news and be tempted to think, is that really true? Well, yes, it is. And no matter what's going on in our own country at this time, when we look at it globally, we see the kingdom is growing. Look at Asia, look at Africa, look at South America. And he can grow his kingdom here in Britain, in Leicester, no matter what recent decades have been like in this country. And if we are believers in Christ, we are part of that growing kingdom. So do we want to get on board with that vision, make ourselves available to God and pray that we won't just go back to how things were before the virus? But like the psalm writer looks to see God's glory and goodness, will we look for the same in our lives and communities? I need to expand my vision beyond looking forward to sitting in Cafe Nero again, nice though that will be. And dare I say it, we need to look beyond being able to worship in our own building again. 
We need to get on board with how Jesus might use each of us in growing the mustard tree and how he might use each of us as yeast in expanding the bread dough. If you're in Christ, it's the same for you. The kingdom vision is a far bigger vision than simply being able to worship in our building again. And it's what we're called to. We must look to the future, confident in who God is and what he does, and available to be used by him in his plans. We must not yearn to get back to the status quo if that status quo falls short of God's vision for his kingdom. One line in Psalm 85 is a warning. Verse 8. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Anything in our lives which was folly before the virus will still be folly after the virus. So let's not use so-called normality as our benchmark. Instead, let's pursue holiness and the big vision of God's kingdom, not just settling for so-called normality. Let's see the future as a place where we might, through prayer, through trust, through obedience, see God's glory and goodness. Just in closing, I think it might be worth reading verses 8 to 13 of the psalm again, and also Jesus' short parables, and then maybe take a moment to reflect and pray on what you've heard. Thank you.